Okay, last week, uh, last time we had class, we looked at uh, some of the corruption that came into the churches. Uh, early churches were corrupted in their area of baptism. Remember, that's a great example of how quickly the churches went, uh, went astray. And a simple a symbol is turned into this... Uh, <laughs> Uh, not only is it a way to heaven, part of the, the ticket to heaven, but it's also uh, becomes this massive, uh, you know, councils about what to do with it, popes making decisions. Um, anyway, infant baptism, simple symbol, becomes infant baptism by sprinkling. And uh, then another example was the corruption of church government and how that there were simple pastors... Paul established churches and had pastors inst installed over those churches. Titus, Timothy, Epaphroditus, many others that we don't know their names. Um, and then that went from just being simple local churches to becoming this huge hierarchy of churches and bishops and cardinals and popes and patriarchs and all of these different positions over different churches. So the corruption of church government. Um, by the way, I uh, have a lot of books on church history. One of them is called The Soul of St. Louis. I think I mentioned that to you. And in the, in the 1800s, Methodists, Methodist preachers were very involved in missions work around St. Louis. And, and believe it or not, one of their main uh, doctrines that they taught and practiced, taught to their churches as they established these churches and, and in practice, was this very idea of a, of a local church having polity over itself. In other words, it was, it was their own church government, not the Catholics, not the Protestants, uh, even though Methodism, Methodism technically is a Protestant uh, denomination. Um, but I just thought that was very interesting from their own quotes, how much emphasis they put on a pastor having the authority over his congregation only. Um, so that, that is, it's a Baptist doctrine because it's a Bible doctrine. But more than a Baptist doctrine, it's a Bible doctrine. And so it's very important that this, uh, this doctrine of local church government stay within a local church. Another corruption was the union of the church and state. Who did that? Who brought those two together? Constantine, Constantine was the main one. And uh, so he granted religious freedom, right? To all churches, all Christians. Isn't that great? You don't like religious freedom. Oh, okay. So you're saying, no, that's not good. What do you, what's, the, what's the problem with that? <laughs> yes, they had freedom as long as you were a part of his church. It's more. Also established like a hierarchy over the, uh, the church. Sure, established even more hierarchy over the church, and now the hierarchy is not even Christianity. It's not even bishops and patriarchs anymore. It's the Pope, who is the Roman Emperor. <laughs> so uh, it really just blew up the whole uh, the whole authority. Who is in authority now? It's a pagan emperor is literally an authority over the church. Another corrupted area was in the priesthood. And we quickly summarized this up in the pagan practices that were Christianized, so-called. Um, we've mentioned these before. And there's many, many different traditions and uh, rituals in the Catholic Church that are purely pagan, and they're brought in and Christianized. Can you give me some examples of that? If you have your book... You're well ahead. Anybody have their book? No. Oh, yes, you do, because you have it on ebook. That's right. So, what is? What are some rituals since uh, Tamar is on the ball? Okay. How about the rosary? Right. How about the the relics? We're going to get to that in a lot of detail th uh, sometime soon. Relics. Oh, uh, they, they claimed all of these things. Relics, by the way. Anybody know what I'm talking about with relics? Uh, little, you know, this is part of the cross. This wood is actually part of the cross of Jesus, so-called. Don't believe that. But that's what they said. Go. I like the spirit that they claim that pierced in Jesus' heart. 
all kinds of things like that. Hair from the Apostle Peter. Um, relics, things that the, the Catholic Church venerated these things, honored them, and blessed them, and therefore then they could, then it, this is, what's our word, authenticated. They authenticated these things, and then they would take them and sell them for money. So, uh, obviously, this is pure. Where do you find that in the Bible? I don't, don't, what immediately comes to my mind is Peter, when Simon, that sorcerer in the book of Acts, came to Peter and said, hey, I want to buy this power. And Peter rebuked him as a child of the devil, which he was. So, bringing these pagan practices. Worshipping Mary as the sinless queen of heaven. All of those, those are pagan practices that became Christianized. Bells and on and on and on. Okay, so those are old, uh, sorry, those are uh, corrupted practices brought into the Christian church and obviously those would have long-term, major long-term effects upon the church. All right, today we're going to look at the church fathers, the church fathers, so-called. <clears throat> um, there are many, many church fathers in the Catholic Church, uh, preceding, preceding the Catholic Church, and uh, these church fathers... Uh, established the doctrines and the teachings and the traditions of the Catholic Church. And so we're going to see what many of these church fathers, uh, what they brought to the Catholic Church. Nowadays, those doctrines are just accepted as, uh, you know, standard doctrine for the Catholics. But those doctrines were developed over long periods of time here in these early years of the church. I say early, first four or five hundred years primarily. And so let's look at a number of these fathers and see what they brought to the table. Now when we say church fathers, let's bag up. These are not what we think, what we would agree to as the fathers of the church. Um, okay, we have some Canadians in here. Who, who are the founding fathers of your area where you're from? Okay. Interesting. Who settled the area? In Quebec would be Jacques Cartier in 1608. Wow. See, there you go. Can you add some more to that? You know your Canadian history better than Caleb? Mm, no. Those two names. Those two names. <laughs> Can you, okay. Champlain, I recognize that name. Lake Champlain. That's what I know. I've never seen it. Never been there but I've heard of it. Um, okay, so those are some of your founding fathers. Okay, in America, we have our founding fathers. Okay, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Bill Clinton. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no. Uh, William Jefferson Clinton, you know, he was named after Thomas Jefferson, he once famously said, which is a total joke. Um, anyway, so... Uh, we have our founding fathers here in America. Uh, do you know your, any of your Filipino history? Not too much. Your dad grew up? Did he, he, he grew it, up, well, he came here in high school, so. I see, that's what I thought. Ended up growing up here, so. so. anyway, he would probably know he Filipino know. history. I mean, I know Lapu Lapu. Sure. Which is a guy who basically assassinated Magellan. Oh, okay. To free, to free the Filipinos. I see, okay. So I'm sure there's all... Anyway, founding father. I don't know if he was a founding father, but still, probably it wasn't. Um, founding fathers are people who establish something. Our founding fathers here in America established this country and established the, the foundations for our constitution, for our form of government, our, our federal form of government. Different layers, different levels. You have Congress and the executive branch and the judicial branch, and you have the states. And these are all different levels. Well, those are actually not all different. The levels are the, fed, the national government and the state government and the county government. Those are the levels. But anyway, so that's what our founding fathers did for America. <clears throat> Church fathers, and specifically the ones that we're going to discuss, were not the actual church fathers. 
They were not. Um, let me give you a couple examples here. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, how does Paul refer to Timothy? <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So Paul solidifies his credentials as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And look what Paul has in the next verse, verse number 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. So Timothy is the son of his spiritual father. And I know this is not talking about a church father. I understand that. But Paul identifies himself as an apostle and as a spiritual father to Timothy. And he had many sons in the faith. Timothy is the main one that we would think of. But Paul here is, as an apostle, giving to the church what they need to lead the church and for that church to be what Jesus said it would be as far as uh, uh, Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 tells us that the gates of hell cannot stop the church. Well, turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> verse number 1, Paul, an apostle... And then in parentheses, the rest of the verse, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, if you know the context of Galatians chapters 1 through 3, Paul's establishing his credentials as an apostle of Jesus Christ. How is that? Because he didn't receive his teaching and his doctrine from the other apostles. He didn't receive his doctrine from any man. He received it from God, from Jesus Christ specifically. Okay, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And in the rest of this chapter, he's very clear. That's his purpose is to show that his teaching came from God, not from man. He didn't even go see the other apostles. Remember, he got saved at Damascus. And later on in the chapter here, he says that he never even went to Jerusalem. Verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Paul didn't go to Jerusalem to say to James and John, and you know, what, what do you all believe? What is the teaching that Jesus gave you? Paul says, I didn't do that. I didn't even see these other apostles until three years later, verse 18. And the only apostle there I saw was Peter and James, verses 18 and 19. So what's, what did he do? Paul got saved on the road to Damascus. He left Damascus after preaching there for a while. And he went to Arabia. What happened in Arabia? He doesn't tell us a lot of that. Uh, we, we do know that he met with God because he's very open about how God taught him these things. It probably happened in Arabia. He's out there at Mount Sinai, most likely. He talks about that also in chapter 3. He's at Mount Sinai. He was by himself, and God taught him that doctrine. So when he came back to Jerusalem, he was recognized by the other apostles, but it was not because... He received his teaching from them. He was recognized by the other apostles because he, like they, had received his teachings from Jesus himself. So these founding fathers, these apostles of Jesus Christ, had their teachings from the Lord Jesus Christ. Not from some other person, not from a university, not from the uh, St. James Convent. <laughs> See, that's, that's a mess up right there, right? Uh, St. James Convent. Okay, I messed up. Uh, St. James Monastery. How's that? And the Mount Sinai Monastery. Oh, he didn't receive that teaching from the founding fathers of the church. They received their teachings from the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they wrote it down, and we have all that we need. We have all that we need for the 
New Testament church age to run its course, you know, for, for us to know what to do. Just like in the Old Testament, they had all they needed for the law, to the, the living under the time of the law, for that to be carried out. You understand that? So I don't have time to develop the whole thing because there's so many things here. The Apostle Paul, and I've, I've stressed this before and I can't over, overstress this without going into it too much and I have a whole separate class on this. Pauline doctrine was that the Apostle Paul, primarily as the Apostle to the Gentiles for the church, that the Apostle Paul uh, was the one who set up all of the structure, the foundations for the church. If you understand that, and sometime hopefully that can be developed some more, but if you understand that, then, then it makes it very clear that he's the church father and the other apostles, James and Peter and so on, and the ones who wrote in the New Testament, who is it, James, Peter, Jude, John, these other writers, that they established the foundation for the church. And Jesus, of course, obviously. Okay? So those are the church fathers. That has to be settled in your own mind. Um, Jude, verse 3. Jude, verse 3. Famous verse. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, unto the saints. So, that faith was delivered to the saints. And this is the whole Bible preservation issue. If the, the Word of God, if that faith was delivered to the saints, then we have it. We have it. It's right here. We have all of it. God is very careful about His words, individual words. So we have all of that faith. It was delivered to the saints. It was given to us. We have it. And the church fathers, the real church fathers, were used to uh, give us that faith. Now, if any other doctrine disagrees with this faith, then they can't be church fathers. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Uh, if they disagree with this, then they are the heretics. Not, not uh, you know, they wouldn't deny, they wouldn't knock the Apostle Paul. They, the Catholics would never say anything bad about James and John. They, we know that. But they would certainly deny the doctrines that those, that those men taught. Who was I talking to the other day about talking to a Catholic priest? Was that you? No, that was not you. Anyway, I, th I thought it was one of you. Maybe it wasn't. Um, oh, I know who it was. Okay, never mind, never mind. It, wasn't, it was uh, John Leach. And he was talking about, he, he saw somebody that was Amish the other day. And so he went up to him and he said, uh, yeah, my, my teacher used to be Amish, but he got to studying the Bible and became a Christian. <laughs> I was like, oh, you probably shouldn't have said that, but oh well. Um, it's the truth, you know. The point is it's one or the other. When you start believing the Bible, you leave religion and you become a Christian. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, so church fathers, I'm going to call this section the church fathers, but this is not really the church fathers. This is according to the Catholics. The church fathers established all the doctrine for the Catholic church. Just like, <laughs> they would really not, just like the real church fathers, Jesus and his doctrine, Paul and his doctrine, Peter, James, John, Jude, and their doctrine. Just like the real church fathers established the doctrine for the true churches. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, these church fathers gave their teachings and, of course, they were, uh, became the foundation for the Catholic Church. Um, there's another big problem with this, of course. These church fathers 
were all a part of the hierarchical system. So they were bishops and uh, patriarchs and so on. They had advanced through the ranks of the church. <laughs> and so they were using their authority in that church to present their teachings as gospel. And of course, it was added to the scriptures in practice. It was called tradition, or it was called the interpretation of the scriptures. Okay, now these church fathers, we want to divide them into four divisions. <clears throat> Here's according to the Catholics. They say that there are church fathers, first of all, that were apostolic. So this would be the New Testament apostles. These are, they claim as this is the apostolic fathers. These are also church fathers to them. But of course, that's where we stop, right there. Then there are the Antonicene Fathers. The Antonicene Fathers, which means the Church Fathers who came before the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. <clears throat> so this would be, um, the Antonicene Fathers would be basically 100 to 300. So about two centuries of church fathers, quote-unquote. The apostolic fathers, uh, we can, just to keep it simple, let's call this the zero to 100. Um, when did John, the beloved, probably about when did he die? Anybody know? 96 AD is the accepted date for that. So time of Jesus, birth of Christ, until the end of John's era, which he was the last apostle to die, um, so it's basically that century, the Apostolic Fathers. The Antonicene Fathers is 100 to 300. So it's actually about 100 to 325 or so. We'll, we'll keep it simple like this. Then there are the Nicene Fathers. The Nicene Fathers. Those who are alive in that century of the Council of Nicaea. And that was a very large turning point. Obviously, in 323 is when uh, Constantine became the first emperor to take over the, Catholic, the church. But the Nicene Fathers, and so this is the 400s. Sorry, sorry, the 4th century, the 300s. Wow, that is, needs some help. 300 to 400. And then there are the post-Nicene Fathers. And that is approximately 400 to 500. So for about 100 years worth, I'm sorry, 500 years worth of church fathers. Now, we're going to talk about the Council of Nicaea a little bit later on um, and see what uh, those major issues were, the settling the doctrine, uh, the controversy over uh, between Arius and a uh, Athanasius, two church patriarchs. Uh, basically, the Catholic Church affirmed the deity of Christ uh, with one of their little phrases. This is one of those schisms that uh, they love to get into. Okay, um, all of these church fathers that we're going to discuss were infected with false doctrine. They all had false doctrine, and that's what I want to point out to you, is these false doctrines that uh, they brought into the Catholic Church, and now they are a regular, I mean, they're rock-solid foundational doctrines for the Catholic Church. <clears throat> even, the, uh, even the very earliest church fathers, by the way, sorry, I, I didn't quite say this right. The apostolic fathers is not only the apostles. There were some fathers church fathers, who lived at the same time as the apostolic fathers, overlapped a little bit, and then lived, but they lived in the same time as the apostles. So the apostolic fathers is the apostles and those church fathers who outlived the apostles. There's only, there's only one, two of those. <clears throat> so... But all of them were infected with false doctrine. By the way, P 
Peter's false teaching, um, where he catered to the Jews versus the Gentiles in Galatians chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 15, that was false teaching that had already wanted to make its way into the church. And of course, they put a stop to it. The problem with these others is that the church did not put a stop to these other false teachings. And therefore, they are now a rock solid part of their foundation. So understand that. <clears throat> All right, so the church fathers are fathers of the Catholic Church. So let's talk about these, uh, these men. I'm going to give you, I think I have 11 of these. And some of the doctrines that they teach are the same. Some, most are, many of them are different, though. The first is Ignatius. Ignatius. He was... Uh, Definitely lived in the same time as the, as the other apostles, many of them. 50 to about 110, 50 A.D. to 110 A.D. Um, he was the bishop, he was a pastor in Antioch, where the apostle Paul was sent from. Now, he was not the pastor when Paul was sent out. Uh, he was probably not the pastor while Paul was alive. Uh, he was born in around 50, and Paul was probably, um, they believe he was uh, probably beheaded somewhere around 63, I think it's 63 or 65 A.D. or something like that. And so Ignatius would have been a young man. But he eventually became the pastor of the church at Antioch. And um, in 110 A.D., he was sent to Rome for trial, and he was martyred for the cause of Christ. And so you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, that's not the rest of the story, right? Um, his error was that he taught that churches should have elders and a ruling bishop. So he made this first distinction between the bishop and who was underneath the bishop. A bishop and an elder and a pastor and a deacon, if you will. Anyway, he was the first to exalt one bishop over another. He seems to have claimed in some of his writings that uh, a church did not have authority to baptize unless they had a bishop. Think about that. So if you've got a new church being planted that they don't have authority to baptize until the bishop who is over his home church and over any other small churches, he has to come there and baptize. And of course, I don't believe that at all. I believe as soon as the church is started and the pastor has the authority from God to baptize. Okay, so you can tell that's the beginning of this false teaching about pastors being different than bishops and elders. Relatively innocent, right? Relatively innocent errors. Not a big deal. Prepared the way for more error in the next century. Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr. He uh, embraced Christianity. He was about 100 to 165. About 100 to 165. Um, he uh, held on to some of his pagan philosophy when he embraced Christianity. And so let's point out a couple things that he taught and introduced into the church. He interpreted the scriptures allegorically. He interpreted the scriptures allegorically. What's the problem with that? What, is, what does that mean to interpret the scriptures allegorically? Mm -hmm. that they're only stories. Okay, they're stories. So they weren't actual, like real historical um, happenings or Sure. The, the Bible is not interpreted as actual historical events that actually happened. They're stories to illustrate a point. They're stories to illustrate, you know, about some things about God or whatever. Um, 
And of course, that is a really wrong way to interpret Scripture because it leads into all kinds of error. Um, we, we interpret literally, and there's, a, there's many things to learn just in the interpretation of Scripture, how we should interpret Scripture. We interpret literally, automatically first, unless there's an obvious different way to interpret it. So, of course, there are poems in the Bible that are not meant to be taken literally, but we interpret them literally as a poem, and so on. So, uh, anyway, he interpreted the scriptures allegorically. He also helped develop the idea of a middle state after death between heaven and hell. A middle state after death. What eventually would this become? Purgatory, obviously. Justin Martyr, about 100 to 165 A.D. Okay, Irenaeus. That's by N A E U S. That's correct. He was a pastor in France, and uh, he wrote a, a article. He called it "Against Heresies." Against heresies. Well, that sounds pretty good. I'm against heresies. Okay, now what heresies are you against? Let's see what he was against. Or four. In, that, in those writings, he supported the authority of the bishop as a ruler over many churches. By the way, he, like many of the other, in fact, many of these early church fathers, they would never, think about this, they would never associate with the modern Catholic church. Never. Th these are not... You know, they didn't see themselves as church fathers. It was the Catholic Church of later years going back to their writings and saying, see, we claim these as ours because they knew what they were talking about. They interpreted the Bible the right way. And so therefore, they're, it's not as if these men knew that they were going to be called the founding fathers of the Catholic Church. That was not their intent. They were just local pastors over, you know, maybe having the bishopry over several churches, but they didn't see themselves as these fathers of the, of the Catholic Church at all. But they wrote, they believed certain things, and those doctrines were used by the Catholic Church of later years to develop their uh, foundation. So I think it's important to understand that. But uh, Irenaeus, he defended the authority of the bishop as a ruler over many churches. He also defended church traditions. And so the Catholic Church claims him as one of their own on that basis. Okay, next, Clement of Alexandria. And can you tell where he pastored at? Yes, very good. Alexandria. He headed the school of Alexandria from 190 to 202. And that school was famous for its allegorizing. In other words, they believed in an allegorical interpretation of Scripture, not actual literal interpretation of Scripture. Clement of Alexandria helped develop the doctrine of purgatory and the doctrine of the universal church, which the word universal is the word what? Anybody remember? Starts with a C. <laughs> Universal. What's the word? It's called Catholic. Huh. Wow. That was deep. <clears throat> remember? Catholic means universal. Always remember that. Catholic means universal. So he uh, believed in this philosophy of Plato that everything is universal. And of course, that goes, that goes back to a pagan philosophy. Tertullian. Another church father. Uh, lived in Carthage. Oh, wow. Way out there on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, uh, of course... 
uh, anyway, the, the Christianity had spread because of uh, shipping and so on across, you know, obviously there's uh, all kinds of sea routes all over the Mediterranean uh, way before this and during the, the Christian times, if you want to call them that. Anyway, so there were churches out in Carthage and he was a pastor. And so even out there, there were connections all over the Middle East and these false doctrines were spread. Um, he actually did some good things. He fought against Gnosticism, but he also exalted the authority of the church beyond that allowed in Scripture. The authority of the church. And of course, that would uh, lead you know, to all of these other errors and false doctrines. He also believed that the bread of the Lord's Supper actually became Christ. Oh, there we go. The mass would, would eventually, of course, develop from this. He supported and adopted Montanism. That's a teaching by a so-called prophet named Montanus. Um, and uh, Montanus, I believe if I remember right, was also a uh, teacher in North Africa there. And that had to do with the inspiration of God. Anyway, so he, uh, this guy, Tertullian, had a number of false teachings. Let me just mention a couple other things quickly. He taught that uh, widows who, who uh, remarried committed fornication. Ridiculous. He taught that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. That's Catholic doctrine big time today. He classified sin into three categories. That is Catholic doctrine today. There's original sin, there is venial sin, and there is... I forget the third one. I can't remember my catechism. I'm kidding. Um, but this idea was a part of the uh, other teaching on infant baptism, that little children have original sin that they need to be forgiven of, and when they get baptized, that washes away their original sin. But then they still have to take the Mass and keep the rules of the Catholic Church to get rid of their other kinds of sins, their venial sins and whatever the third kind was. So this helps support the idea of infant baptism, that you get rid of your original sins by being baptized as an infant. Okay. Uh, he taught also that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist and when God was not a father. <laughs> Sounds like the Mormons. Um, he taught that Mary was the second Eve who by her obedience remedied the disobedience of the first Eve. Can't, what's, the, what's the truth of that? What does the Bible talk about a second and a first? Huh? Help me out. How about a first Adam? And a second Adam? Romans chapter 5. Okay, so we have... Uh, Adam was the first Adam. Christ is the second Adam who remedied the first Adam's sin, not Eve and Mary. That's never taught in the Bible. Okay, so he added a bunch of things to Scripture. And obviously, the, these things, as they spread... See, there was no... Technically, there was no Catholic Church at this time. So we're still talking just false teachings becoming prevalent among Christianity. False teachings being spread. These major centers of the church are being infiltrated with false teaching and, and uh, infected would be a better word for it, with false teachings. Okay, so these are some of these uh, early church fathers. Next, Cyprian, C-Y. Uh, I don't know when he was born, but he died in 258. He was the Bishop of Carthage, the Bishop of Carthage. And, uh, of course, this was a, a great church at Carthage, and so he was the bishop, and he was very wealthy. He had others who, in, in that area, North Africa, 
he had, there, were, there were a number of Bible-believing groups, we're going to talk about them soon, who stood up to these false doctrines, and they said that baptism was not for infants. And so if you read your history books, the ones that talk about the Novations, you'll see that the Novations were heretics. We shouldn't associate with the, with the heretics, right? Well, you've got to find out why they're being called heretics. They're being called heretics because they didn't believe in salvation through baptism or salvation through the Mass. They didn't believe in, in uh, the traditions of the church. They had other problems. There were certainly problems in the, among the Novations as well. But they were heretics to the, these established Christian churches. And that, of course, uh, made them uh, persecuted and so on. But Cyprian was a wealthy bishop who wrote against the Novation churches. Um, he defended this, the doctrine that bishops had authority over many churches. He also taught infant baptism. This is 250 A.D. So you see many of these large established churches. Uh, the First Baptist Church of Carthage. <laughs> uh, it wasn't called that. But they had, they had already uh, taken in false doctrine and obviously at a very high level. No wonder Cyprian was made one of the saints of the Catholic Church later on, much after his death, because he had many of these doctrines that the Catholics liked. Okay, now let's get to the worst one, I think the worst one, origin. Origin. He lived uh, 185 to 254. 185 to 254. Um, Origen was actually persecuted by the Roman emperor Decius in uh, 250. He was tortured for the cause of Christ, supposedly. Um, so... Just because somebody is tortured and persecuted doesn't make them a Baptist. <laughs> and it doesn't make them a great Christian. It simply means that he stood for his faith, what he believed, against the Roman Empire. At this time, of course, there is no Roman Catholic Church that hadn't been developed yet. But Origen was loaded with false teachings. Um, bi not, uh, not Bible. Church history... No, sorry. Church historians have a hard time knowing what to make of Origen because he had good things and bad things. He, he did take a stand in a lot of ways for things that he believed in, but so many of his teachings were horrific. I mean, way off the, the deep end. So let's mention some of these things. Um, he denied the infallible inspiration of Scripture. He denied the infallible inspiration of Scripture. He rejected the literal history of Genesis. <clears throat> Will Durant, a historian, says in a book called The Story of Civilization, he quotes Origen. This is Origen's quote. Who is so foolish as to believe that God, like a husbandman, planted a garden in Eden and placed in it a tree of life? So that one who tasted of the fruit obtained life? That's his origin. Who would be dumb enough to believe that? <laughs> okay. Uh, so he rejected the literal history of Genesis and the creation account. He accepted infant baptism. Um, we could give you a lot of things. He believed in purgatory and universalism. <clears throat> He believed that men's souls are pre-existent and that stars and planets possibly have souls. Okay, you're nuts. He believed that Jesus Christ was a created being. Now, later on, there'd be another great church father, according to them, Arius, who would take this even further and claim, of course, that Jesus was not actually God. He was a created being. And uh, then this controversy, this schism, would be settled by the
the Council of Nicaea in 325. But Origen also believed that, and the Catholic Church would later denounce that. But they still count Origen as one of their church fathers because he had so many other things they agreed with. Okay, he also denied the resurrection of Christ, and he interpreted the Bible allegorically. He said this, quote, The scriptures have little use to those who understand them literally. That's for you. Uh, we take the Bible literally. We believe that it means what it says, and it says what it means. And therefore, the scriptures are of little use to us because we interpret them that way according to origin. Um, he is certainly one of the great false teachers in this early stages of the church. And the Catholic Church looks up to him as a great church father. That's a mess. Next, Eusebius. Eusebius of Caesarea. E-U. Eusebius of Caesarea. 270 to 340. He was a fan of Origen. <clears throat> and of course, during Eusebius' lifetime, Constantine joined, as, as he was the emperor of the Roman Empire, Constantine joined the church and the state. Uh, you got to understand, for hundreds of years, the church, church had been under attack by Roman emperors, more so than some at different times than others, but still, as a whole, for several hundred years, they'd been under persecution. Constantine comes along and switches that and says, no, no, they're not being persecuted now. They're going to be uplifted and promoted from the state. And I'm sure all kinds of churches said, wow, this is great. The, the Roman emperor is going to lift us up and he's going to help us spread our faith. Well, true Bible believers were not part of that. They didn't experience that uh, freedom of worship. And they went into hiding, many of them. They went into their own. They rejected that. However, these kinds of churches that uh, the church at Carthage, the church at Alexandria, the church at Antioch, many of these main churches, they all welcomed this new recognition because they were after money already. They were after uh, position already and so on. And that's where we find Eusebius as well. Um, it, it's believed that Eusebius changed a lot of the text of Scripture. Uh, some of these, uh, some of the modern versions, um, they're noted omissions from the original, from the Greek text. I shouldn't call them original. From the Greek text, many people believe that Eusebius did those things. They believe that he... Uh, came up with some of the false, some of the wrong, erroneous Greek texts. And so he's, he's definitely a, a guy who brought a lot of false doctrine into the church. And he's looked at as a church father. All right, uh, there's another one here, Jerome. Uh, oh, let me mention him. We need to get finished up here. But uh, Jerome, uh, he <clears throat> was uh, involved in the teaching of asceticism. Asceticism. Um, the, the idea of mon monastic living was an old idea. That had been brought in um, many, many years before this time. But he brought the idea of monasticism into the church. And so that's why he's pretty significant for that. Um, one, one well-known group of, of uh, monastic-type living people was the Essene group. And they were developed before the time of Christ. Remember, it was the Essenes who lived at Qumran. And, most likely, who lived at Qumran and saved a lot of those old scriptures in those caves at Qumran. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947... That's what the Essene group had stored away in 73, no, sorry, in 70 AD when, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Roman army was coming through. And just, they hid those in those caves. Anyway, so that was already an example of a monastic type group. 
But to bring it into the church, in the New Testament church, that uh, has definitely some credit given to Jerome for that. He venerated holy relics, bones of dead Christians. And so obviously now we're seeing a lot of these pagan practices becoming a part of the Catholic Church. What did they believe about their little water? The holy water, right? Uh, we knew a guy growing up that for uh, some reason we went and visited them sometimes. And they were Catholic, but claimed to be saved. But they had a little bottle sitting there of holy water that the priest had blessed. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, he brought the idea of holy water into the church. You know, so the next thing probably after this would be the holy hanky, right? Because you got to have a holy hanky to spread over the sick child. Heal him. Okay, so Jerome brought many false teachings into the Catholic Church. Ambrose. Ambrose in Italy. <clears throat> another uh, false teacher, another church father to the Catholics. Um, he had a strong influence upon Augustine, which would be the next one we'll look at. Um, so he had influence on Augustine. He taught a number of things. Obviously, he taught a lot of the things we've already mentioned, the allegorical method of interpretation. The church has power to forgive sins. That's a big one because that's, that'll lead into the, the great power that the church had over uh, millions and millions of people during the Dark Ages. Um, he also taught that virginity is better than marriage. And this helped bring in the idea of the monastic system as well. Okay, so those are some of his teachings. Augustine. Augustine is also one of the worst. Just remember, Origen and Augustine, two of the worst. Uh, he had so many false doctrines, and he is looked at as one of the great leaders. He's, called, he's looked at as a doctor of the church. I mean, he's always recognized as one of the greatest fathers um, one of the main things that he brought into the church, his contribution, if you will, is that he brought the idea of persecuting unbelievers. He persecuted those who disagreed. Now notice that that's the first time that this has really come up. And so Augustine made a theological case for persecuting those who didn't believe in infant baptism persecuting those who didn't believe that the sacraments are saving grace. Um, can you imagine? Taking the Bible, supposedly, taking the Bible and developing theology on how to persecute those who don't agree with you. <laughs> okay, uh, one of his verses that he liked to use is in the book of Matthew where it talks about, I'm sorry, in the book of Luke, compelling them to come in that Christ required the churches to use force against heretics. Now, his enemies specifically were the Donatists in North Africa, Bible believers, which they were, they're heretics. Well, people thought for years they must be heretics. Well, in the last 100, 150 years, discoveries have been made about them, and, and their writings were found. Oh, what do they actually believe in? Well, they believe in salvation by grace through faith. They believe that uh, baptism is not necessary for salvation. They believe in a smaller church government, all things that we would agree with. So maybe they weren't heretics after all, and in fact, they were not. But So uh, Augustine's enemies were the Donatists, and he, he found some scriptures to help him persecute them, and he developed doctrines uh, about that and had writings made. Uh, he said that he's the one who said that anybody who doesn't believe in infant baptism, that they should be accursed. <laughs> they should go to hell because they don't believe in infant baptism. That's, uh, anyway, so he, he had huge problems. He believed in, he, he taught the doctrine of celibacy for the priests and for the Pope, and uh, all kinds of other problems. 
So he developed very much the idea that the papacy came from, by this time they had developed the first pope, he, he believed that the papacy came from the apostles, from Peter, and so on. Okay, so you see there's lots and lots of problems. Uh, eh, let me just mention one more. Cyril, C-Y-R-I-L, Cyril. Um, he was the patriarch of Alexandria. He promoted the veneration of Mary because she was the mother of God, the mother of God. So remember that argument that uh, they worship Mary because she's the mother of God. Well, she's the mother of Jesus in his humanity, not in his deity. But this doctrine was developed by Cyril of Alexandria. 376 to 444 was uh, his lifespan. He also persecuted the Donatists, Christians, and uh, we'll look at them uh, in a couple class periods from now. Okay, any questions about these things? Right, we'll leave it off right there. Pretty, pretty sorry founding fathers, if you ask me.